Hi, and welcome back to the Rock Candy Sew Along. I'm Julie Herman of Jaybird Quilts, and I'm here this week to talk about quilting. So last week we finished piecing our Rock Candy Table Topper, and now we wanna go ahead and quilt and bind it. So the first step in quilting is to decide how you're going to quilt it. Many of my Rock Candy Table Toppers have been professionally long arm quilted, I know it's not that practical to send something of this size to a long arm quilter. I'm often sending a few of them at a time along with some pillows so it makes sense to do them all on one backing. But for today's example, I'm going to go ahead and quilt this on my regular machine with a walking foot so that you can see it's just as amazing done at home. So first step is to go ahead and make my sandwich. I need my quilt top, my batting, and my backing. And I've chosen to use a scrap from my Nebula quilt and a scrap of batting. You just need a piece of each one that are larger than your rock candy topper. I've kind of trimmed these just because I was cutting from some weird scraps, but it doesn't matter if yours are larger, you'll trim that all down after you're finished quilting. So the next step is to pin it together. And I have these um, curved safety pins, I've had these for a long time that I use when basting something here at home. And depending on the size of your project is going to determine how many pins you want to use. Obviously, if you are making a large quilt, you will want to use more pins than um, if you're just making a small table topper like this. And if you know your pattern that you want to quilt, I would suggest to go ahead and place the pins not in the way of your first few lines of quilting. So I know that the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quilt on either side of these lines. So that's why I'm making sure that I'm putting my pins um, not uh, in the way of those lines. So I'm just gonna put some pins in here. All right, I've got all my pins in. And I should mention that you can also free motion this on a standard home machine. That's just not really my expertise in my wheelhouse. When I do quilting here at home, I prefer to use my walking foot and do straight line quilting. Both are completely good options. If you're comfortable doing free motion quilting on your home machine, I encourage you to go for it. So now that I have it basted, my next step is to figure out my thread. And I could do six different threads, but I really don't wanna be playing around with thread changes for a project that is this small. So I took out a couple options, this like lilac and this variegated yellowy orange and this pale pink. And I laid them on all the different colors and I decided that I think this pale pink is what is going to blend in best. It'll, it'll definitely pop on the darker colors, but it'll blend in most of the place and I kind of want the piecing to be the star, not the quilting. So I'm gonna go with this. It is Arfil um, 2423, if you're interested in using the same one. I am now over at my machine and I've gotten my light pink thread loaded and I have my walking foot on. And I will um, give you a diagram of what I end up doing um, in this week's email. Um, so if you're watching this video and you were not signed up, um, go ahead and sign up for the sew along so that you can get the diagram. Um, but I will show you what I end up doing. I think what I'm gonna do is, as I said, I'm gonna do lines for these six um, to start, and then we'll see where I go from there. So I often use piecing as my landmarks. Since I press my seams open, um, I don't stitch in the ditch. I also just don't tend to find that to be the most attractive, um, personally. Uh, so I will, in this case, I'm gonna start close to a corner. And I'm just gonna do a little bit just to get my thread started. And kind of tack that down. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my foot as a guide. Um, so I'm gonna end up being, it looks like maybe about three eighths of an inch. Um, it's a little more generous than a quarter away from this seam. Um, you can do a quarter, you can do whatever. I like to use my foot as a guide because the foot is consistent. And then I can just continue following along. So I'm gonna use, um, the inside part of my foot here as a guide and stitch all along this um, line through my table topper.
Now it's important that you're using a walking foot here because um, uh, the first time I went ahead and did quilting like this, I didn't know any better and so I didn't use a walking foot and things will um, bunch without a walking foot. So the, what the walking foot does is it evenly moves the fabric on the top and the bottom at the same time. They both now have feed dogs. If you only have feed dogs on the bottom and nothing on the top, um, things are gonna pull unevenly and you're gonna end up with some unattractive puckers. And I think I just did that with 2.5 and I think I'm gonna change it to three. It might bother some people to have different length stitch lengths in the quilting on the same project. It won't bother me, but I wanna go ahead and switch that to three for my future lines of sewing. So I'm gonna now repeat that line back on the pink side of the line and go to back to the corner where I started. And now I'm back at this corner. If you pieced your raw candy the way the pattern is written, you do not have this diagonal seam here. So if you want to quilt it similar to how I'm quilting it now, I suggest getting a chalk um, marker or a slight pencil, something that you can see depending on the background color that you use that you can erase later and draw that diagonal line so that you have that as a guide. So I have two choices now. I can start and stop my stitching and move on to another side, or I can use this as an opportunity to baste along one side. So I'm gonna increase my stitch length and do that, which will help me later on when I go to put my binding on, keep everything together. Okay, and now that I'm at this corner, I wanna make sure I go back to my correct stitch length. I have done that before where I forget and then I have giant stitches going all the way along my quilt. And I'm going to repeat that process with the guide of my foot to do the straight lines across here as well. And now I'm back at that corner and I'm gonna switch back to my longer stitch length again and baste in my next corner. And then I'm gonna go ahead and sew my last two straight lines. I've now sewn my six straight lines uh, that intersect, um, kind of intersect in my center. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to baste around my remaining four edges. I'm now going to remove my project and assess and decide where I'm going to quilt next. So I now have those six lines, two in every direction. And depending on what batting you are using, that is probably enough or close to enough um, according to the standards of how far apart you can quilt. But just because you can leave it that uh, lightly quilted doesn't mean that's what you want. Um, maybe it is and you can go ahead and be done, but maybe you want something a little more dense. Um, there's so many possibilities. So I am gonna remove my pins at this point because I feel like I have enough stitching to hold everything in place. So I have lots of options here. I have thought about doing the same lines through all of the points. Uh, that would be very densely quilted. Um, I've thought about going along the tops. Uh, what I think that I have decided is I'm gonna kind of echo the V that the lines created by adding some quilting here. I want some guidelines for myself. So I'm gonna go ahead and create them with a ruler and a chalk marker. I'm just gonna simply line this up. And that will give me the guide to go under my foot as if there was piecing there. So I'm gonna repeat and make those two lines all the way around my rock candy. Now that I have all of my lines drawn, I'm gonna head back over to the machine and do that same echo stitching on the inside of each of these Vs. Here's what that's gonna look like. And I'm gonna use that line that I drew with my chalk as if it's a stitching line. Oh, and I made that mistake that I said I might make, which is my stitch length is 
still super long. So I'm gonna go ahead and unpick this and I'll be back in just a second. Took that out, let's try this again. Got my stitch length set, gonna double check that now. I'm gonna go slow as I get to the center and I'm gonna eyeball where I think the middle of my diamond is. And I did pretty good. I'm gonna turn and come back out. Now I'm just gonna travel around to my next point. And continue this process all the way around my table topper. I've now completed all of the quilting that I am going to do on my rock candy. So the next step is to trim my excess batting and backing before I start my binding. And I am simply going to use a straight ruler and line it up on the edge of my piece. And I did that basting uh, when I was doing my quilting, so things will hold together. I highly suggest doing that, especially if your quilting itself does not go all the way to the edge. And cut. And I'm just gonna turn and cut each side until my table topper is all cut out. I now have trimmed off all of my excess and it's time to bind my topper. And with using six different background fabrics, I really wasn't sure what binding I wanted to use so that it didn't take away from that. So I have a stash of leftover bindings from other projects and I kind of took some out and auditioned. And I realized that this binding that I made um, last week for uh, my Nebula lap size quilt actually kind of pulls from the hexagons and because it has the rainbow is going to be a nice perfect finish without taking away um, from my color wheel. So since I already have this made, I'm just going to go ahead and use this to bind my rock candy table topper. I'm now ready to put the binding on my rock candy table topper. In general, we want to avoid having our seams end up at the corners of our quilt. And that can be hard when you're doing a large quilt to kind of plan out where they're gonna be. But when you're working on something this small, what I often do is I will lay my binding out and make sure that all of my seams will land on a side and not at a corner. About an inch away is the closest I'd like to get. So I kind of auditioned my binding in place and I'll adjust it a little bit right left as needed to make sure that I don't end up with one of those exactly at my corner. So once I have that taken care of, it's time to sew my binding into place. And similar rules that we use with any other binding, which is we wanna have a tail. Now, because of the length of the rock candy sides, we can't really have an eight to 10 inch tail. So I'm shooting more here for probably like a six inch, and then I can adjust um, once I get my all the way around. So I'm just gonna start about an inch away from a corner so that I leave as much tail as I can. And I'm going to sew till I get to um, this seam, which if you used different um, background fabrics like mine, you'll see, but if you used one, you won't um, see this line. But that's kind of my guide. Um, it's a quarter of an inch before I get to this side. So I'll show you what that looks like. And I'm gonna just backstitch a little bit and then I'm going to leave my threads attached. And normally if this was square, I would fold it 90 degrees and then 90 degrees. But because it's a hexagon, I need to do something a little bit differently, which is I want to go away from where I'm going. So I actually wanna fold it up like this along there. But specifically what you're looking for is that this is a straight line. So you're folding it away from where you're going next. So up here and then I'm going to fold it back onto my piece and you'll notice that you have less fabric here in your miter than you're probably used to for a 90 degree that is correct that's what you need for a 60 degree miter be good if my sewing machine was in forward and not reverse 
All right, so I'm just gonna continue sewing my binding on. And I'm gonna repeat those same steps at this corner, so till I get to a quarter of an inch. And if anything, you wanna go too short here instead of too long. So more like 3 8 not 1 8 because if you go too long, you can't have a proper miter. If you go too short, what you can still do is fold this properly. So I went too short here to show you. So I should have sewn all the way till where my yellow and my green meet. But what I can do is pull this in place and this neck stitching will hold that corner in place. So if I'm up here and I would fold, that would be way too much here. But if I went too far, I can't compensate. So if you go a little too short, what you do is just use your finger to just roll it to where you should have sewn. And you only wanna do this by a stitch or two, not more than that, because then your corner will get loose. Fold it back to where it's going to go, turn and continue stitching, and then repeat this process in every corner until we get back to our first tail that we started with. I'm now coming to my last corner and I highly recommend you take your time doing these corners. Um, taking your time and making each of these miters on the front is really what's gonna yield that um, good looking corner on the front and on the back with the miter. So taking your time here is well worth it in the long run. Again, I'm just gonna stitch till I get to that quarter inch. Back stitch a little bit. Fold up and away from where I'm going, and then back down. Gonna check my miter, make sure I'm in good shape. And now I'm only gonna sew about an inch, and then I'm gonna take my piece off. Now that I have finished sewing this on, I need to go ahead and figure out where to cut this tail to match up with this one so that I have a perfect loop and you can't tell where I put my seam. I have an extra long tail on the end because I'm using leftover binding. You might have less. Um, but what you're gonna do is take your piece that you just finished with and lay it along the edge, raw edge to raw edge, and open it up. And then lay your starting tail on top of it. And just take a pencil and mark where they meet up. I flipped my piece over so that it's easier to open this up and see my li drawn line. So here is my drawn line. And normally I would add a half an inch to this, uh, but because I have bias and it's gonna stretch, I'm gonna add a little bit less than half an inch. I wanna make sure that I don't end up with too much binding that would bubble. If I was doing straight of grain, I would add just a half an inch, uh, not a little bit scant of half an inch. But I'm gonna go a little bit scant of my half an inch. And I'm gonna draw my line over here and that's where I need to go ahead and cut so that I have enough seam allowance to join my two pieces. You can cut this with scissors or with a rotary cutter. If you're using a rotary cutter, be careful that you don't cut your table topper because you are working very close to it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut this. I'm now gonna work on joining these two pieces and I wanna make sure that I don't twist either one. I wanna make sure that I put them together properly. So I'm gonna open them both up and I'm gonna kinda of pull my table topper like this so that I have room to sew these together and I'm gonna sew these together with a quarter inch seam allowance. I'm just gonna kinda of fold them out of the, my, fold my table topper out of the way And I am gonna backstitch here um, just because I'm not chain piecing and I don't want these threads to come out. And there we go. And what I'm just gonna do here now is I'm going to finger press this open. Um, you could use your iron, but I don't have my iron turned on. 
and I don't know that I would turn my iron on for something this small. If I didn't have it on, I could also use my seam roller. Grab my seam roller. Look at that nice and rolled flat. And then I'm gonna fold this back on itself and use my seam roller to roll it in place. And now I'm just going to sew that remaining section onto my table topper and trim my little dog ears off. Now that I have my binding onto my table topper, the next step is to finish my binding. And here I have two choices. I can do this by hand or by machine. I love doing hand binding, um, but I will frequently do machine if it is something that I need done fast, uh, something that I think is gonna be washed a lot, or something that I just don't have the time to do the hand sewing. Hand sewing is much more of a slower meditative process, but I do love doing it. So I'm gonna show you how to do the hand work. If you'd like to see how I do my binding by machine, I did that recently with my Nebula quilt and there's a link below. So what we need to do now that it's sewn onto the front is wrap it to the back. And I will always start on a side, a straight side, and I use Wonder Clips and I will clip towards the corners, and then I will do the corners after a little bit of my straight sides are clipped, and that way I can get the best possible miter. So let's just put a couple more in. And I don't really care if the clips are up or if they're, they're down. Some people um, have a preference, I don't. Um, if you are using them um, to measure, they have marks on the clear side, then use that side where you need to measure them if you're using them for a different project. So now I have these straight sides and I'm gonna go ahead and clip my corner. And what I wanna do is I wanna look at the front and I wanna pull it a little taut. Not super tight, but I wanna kinda pull that miter out. And I want to split my bulk. So if you look on the front, all my bulk is here on the left. And what I mean by the bulk is the bulk of the miter. So there's less layers here. There's a lot more layers here. And I don't want the bulk on the back to be on the same side. Because if I wrapped this one first and then this one, if you look from like straight overhead, all this bulk is on the left. There's no bulk on the right. So you want to always wrap where your bulk is first. So in this case, that's this side. And I'm going to put a clip close to the corner. And then I want to wrap this side and I wanna be looking at the back while I do it. When you have a 90 degree corner, you do a full tuck of your binding to get that good miter. But if you do a full tuck at a 60, you're gonna end up with this um, strange angle and this missing little triangle. So you only wanna do a partial tuck. It's basically the same amount that you actually did on the front so that this creates a nice, perfect Y. And put another clip, and then I'm gonna turn it back to the front to check and that looks great. And what I mean by the split the bulk is if you can see all my bulk on the front is over here and all my bulk on the back is over here. So it makes for a smoother corner. And so I will repeat that process all the way around until I have all of my binding clipped. The next step is the hand sewing. And generally speaking, I would use a thread that matches my binding. Um, this is 2600, which is my favorite. RFL gray happens to match this binding. But for today's demonstration, so you can see what I'm doing, I'm going to use black, and then I'm gonna take this out when I am done showing you what I'm doing. So I will usually pull off um, 18 to 20 inches. I try not to go too much longer. It's tempting, but it will often turn into a knot and get tingled, and that's the last thing we wanna be dealing with. Now, when it comes to needles, it's a very personal preference. Most people I found bind with a short needle with a small eye. I am apparently not most people. And I like to bind with a really long needle. This one happens to be curved. Um, not that it came that way, it just has bent over time. And I love this needle. This specific one, I found so many quilts, it's not even that sharp anymore. I don't recommend doing things like this, but you know, we all have those things that we do that are not what we would actually recommend. And this is my favorite go-to binding needle. Um, so go ahead and thread your needle. And then then we need to knot one end of this. And you could just tie a knot the way we've all been taught to tie a knot. But I learned one time on the bus to a quilt show a quilter's knot. So in case you don't know what a quilter's knot is, here's a little tip for the day. So take your needle in your one hand and your tail end of your thread in your other hand. 
and place it across your needle, like a cross, and hold it with the thumb that was already holding the needle. And then twist it around like three or four times. Then switch hands to hold what you've twisted with your other hand and pull down. And like magic, you have a knot. Who knew? It's kind of fun. So now that I have my knot, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And one thing I've also discovered when teaching is that some people bind right to left and some people bind left to right. I don't think there's actually a correct or an incorrect way, whichever way uh, feels more comfortable to you, go ahead and do. I bind from right to left and interestingly, I bind away from myself. So I bind up, which I haven't seen many people do this. I, it's just how I learned and it's what's most comfortable for me. I can bind in this direction, but I just, I'm most comfortable going in this direction. So I'll kind of show you both. So what I will do since I have it knotted is I'll usually do a stitch or two into my entire piece, but I'll make sure it doesn't come to the front just to kind of get it started. And then I'll make sure I tuck that tail in. Move that pin out of the way if I need that clip out of the way if I need to. Okay. And then what you want to do is you want to go into your piece, the length of your stitch, this is a really long one, and then up into the very end of your binding. You don't want to take a big bite of your binding. You don't want to just take one thread like that. That'd be too little. You want to kind of go just into it, but enough, but you want to have a shorter stitch in that. So we're going to go down and up and pull our thread through. And basically we don't want to, we want to see as little of this stitching as possible. So even, even in my black, you can barely see it. Um, but if it was gray, you wouldn't see it at all and you wanna just continue around taking little bites. And now sometimes I will do two or three stitches and then pull, but you gotta make sure you don't get your thread tangled anywhere if you do you know, two or three and then pull. Um, but like I said, I bind away from me, so this is what it looks like when I am binding. And I don't use a thimble to push my needle through. It's probably because I have a long needle. If you have a short needle, you might need a thimble. Um, and I keep my finger of my other hand on the bottom to make sure I'm not going too deep. So I'll show you too deep so you can see what that looks like. So if I go too deep right here, I'm poking this finger. And if I didn't catch that too deep, you can see on the other side, you can see my needle, which means after I pull my thread through, you can see my thread. And we've all had this happen. Sometimes it still happens to me, even with my finger underneath. Um, Hopefully if it happens, you catch it soon enough to fix it or your thread blind blends in to where it happened. Obviously this does not blend at all, um, but I'm gonna be taking it out. But having your finger under here is a good way to kind of like, if you poke your finger a little bit, then you know you went too deep. You, what you ideally wanna do is you wanna go through the backing and through the batting, but not the front. Um, if you just go through the backing, if you go too shallow, um, this stitching is not as strong and might not hold up as well over time. So you do wanna get some, some chunk of the batting there, a little bit of meat, so to say, um, and come up. And then just meditatively work your way around while you're watching, binging some show maybe, or watching Tula's Tuesday video, or catching up on one of the Nebula videos. Um, so I will work my way all the way around. And then, um, when I run out of thread, I will, so pretend this is the end, I'll usually do a couple stitches into my piece again and go like this, tie a knot, make sure it's nice and secure. And then depending on how long of a tail it is, I'll tuck that tail in. Um, no point in cutting it, just kind of leave it in there. And then when I get back to the end, um, I will usually overlap um, so when I get back to here, I'll usually overlap about an inch of my stitching and then I will just do some long stitches right behind all of them like this to bury my thread. I'll do that for a few more inches and then I will cut the rest of my thread off. So I hope this information helps you finish your raw candy table topper. I'm going to go ahead and take this black thread out and use my gray thread to finish mine up.
I have completed the hand sewing of my binding to the back of my rock handy table topper. My project is now finished, so I can go ahead and start using it. I hope you have enjoyed joining us on the Rock Handy Sew Along and making your rock handy. I would love to see a photo of yours, so I encourage you to please post it to Instagram or to our Facebook Sew Along community group. Additionally, we have a lot of fun sew alongs planned for next year. Information to sign up is below in the comments. I hope you'll join us next year.